It is very, very special having uh, the new arrivals uh, that came in yesterday, and we kicked it off with a bang. Uh, we had uh, a banquet last night for our week-long uh, training, and it was very, very special. The food was scrumptious, uh, and the meditation on the return of majesty, which is sort of a traditional meditation that we have for our start of a semester or a training, uh, it was deeply stirring to me afresh. And if you knew how many times I had had that meditation, you would say, you're still, you know, it sounds like, Eric, you were hearing it for the first time. That's the way truth is. It is always fresh when you have ears to hear it. And there's a special sort of ear that Christians have. I don't know if you knew this, but, uh, you know, in Revelation it says, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you can say, well, I have an ear. Yeah, but do you have the sort of ear that can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? Because that's a special sort of ear. And if you look back in the Old Testament, you're going to see an ear that is set apart. It's a different ear. It's the ear of a bondservant. And they're going to set their ear before their master and say, no, I have an ear for you. And so that ear will be uh, pierced uh, with an awl. And it's a symbol. Why would an ear be pierced? What is that a symbol of? It's that this ear is set apart to say yes, to heed, to hear what my master says. And that is a set apart ear. That's a consecrated ear. And to even work in the temple of God, or in, in this case, the tabernacle, uh, Aaron uh, killed a bull and he was prescribed very specifically by God how to do this. But each of the priests that were going to work in this sacred holy territory had to submit their ear, their right ear, unto Aaron and he would smear it with blood. Well, that's not a normal ear. That's someone who has an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. And so we want to have such an ear this morning that is set apart. Now, the danger of having a set apart ear, I just want to forewarn you, is that means that whatever God speaks into that ear, you've already said yes to it. And that's why we oftentimes hesitate. It's like when Aaron holds out his finger full of blood, he's like, do you want me to smear your ear? We're like, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute here. Let's think this through. Because we oftentimes like to be in the control position to say yay or nay to something. It's like, I don't really want to give up that. However, Christianity fundamentally rests upon the premise that you have come and given up your life. That you have set your control position in his hands. It's like handing him the steering wheel. It's like, uh, what are you going to do with that? Well, do you trust him? Do you trust that he knows what he created you for, that he knows best? That's a scary thing. Because to be able to trust at that level, you have to know their nature, their character. And God doesn't mind you asking questions. Questions like, who is he? Can I trust him? And, you know, the guy standing in front of you trusts him. I trust him implicitly. I know he's going to come through. I know that he's faithful. However, that wasn't an instantaneous thing. That was a process of building trust. But at the same time, it was a gift, a gift of grace. See, faith in and of itself is a grace that God is going to work inside of me and gift, gift me with. But it's sort of like he gives me a penny of it. And he says, what are you going to do with that penny? And he says, am I worthy of the investment of all you have, Eric? But all I have is a penny. But some of us even hesitate to give the penny of faith that we have in our Lord. Why? Because what if he doesn't come through? I would lose my penny. And we're afraid of disillusionment. However, when you take your penny and you invest it in God, he gives you 10 bucks of faith back because he always proves faithful. See, when you put your faith in a faithful God, he proves himself worthy. He proves himself able to go exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you had confidence in him to see come back. And so when you have $10, what do you do? Some of you stick it in a bank and just try to hold on to it, or you know, as that one character in Scripture wraps it in a napkin and buries it in the soil, right? It's like, well, that's a bad idea. When you have 10 bucks of faith, what should you do with it? Put it all in on God. Sort of a poker concept, even though it's probably not the best thing to bring up in church, right? But it's like, I'm, I'm all in. And you set all your $10 in on Jesus Christ. And what's he going to do? He's going to prove himself faithful. And suddenly you're going to have $1,000, uh, maybe $10,000 worth of faith. It's like this is how you grow in faith. And yet some of you, you need to shove it into the middle. 
you need to say, I believe him. So this is one of those messages that is just, it needs to be given every season or every few seasons for our soul. Everything I'm about to say, you know. And yet that's not unusual in the church. You know, in other words, a lot of pastors feel that they have to be novel in what they do as opposed to give the good stuff. The stuff that has always been true. The stuff that, yeah, your parents knew this, their parents knew this, their parents knew this, because it's the good stuff. It's the old school version of Christianity. It's the stuff that truly works. We have grown up in a version of Christianity that <clears throat> doesn't seem to work very well. And it's led to disillusionment because we've gone off the reservation of the clear word of God and we've come up with our social understanding of it. Some of us have explained scripture based on our experience of it. There's a lot of pastors that, that will not preach the clear word of God because their experience hasn't matched up with that. So they give their experience instead of what the word of God says. It's dangerous stuff because it gets us off the reservation. It gives us, gets us off the clear word. So let's just get back to the clear word. This is a fun message, guys. I don't know if you're as excited as I am for this one. Who do you say that he is? So you could say, well, what is that talking about? Well, that comes from a direct quote of Jesus Christ. In fact, it says it uh, three times in Scripture, and I call it the question everyone must answer. So the disciples have just said, you know, when he said, who do they think I am? And, you know, they give all sorts of options uh, of, you know, Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Elijah, the prophet. He could be John the Baptist raised from the dead. But then he says this, three different, well, three different renditions uh, in the Gospels. But who do you say that I am? Now, I want you to emphasize the you in your mind as I say this. But who do you say that I am? But who do you say that I am? And Peter in classic Peter fashion, says, you are the Christ. What an incredible moment. And even God is go and even Jesus is going to say that that was not something you came up with. That was given to you. In other words, the fact that he can even discern this is a spiritual work in his life. But it's a question that each of us must answer. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because the answer to that question is everything for your eternal life. Everything. It's not just what changes your immediate life, which it does. It changes everything for all time. So we have a, you know, this little baby that is born in Bethlehem. Who is that little baby? Because we sing songs, we have Christmas traditions. I mean, the culture we come from seems to at least talk about it, sing songs about it. But a lot of us think that Jesus was just an everyday little baby that lived an extra special life. And that if I were to say, when did his life begin? You say, uh, well, I'm a, you know, a pro-life sort of person, so I believe it was at conception. And you would be very noble for saying such a thing. However, I'm going to press on that and say, are you sure it didn't begin before that? You say, how could life begin before conception? We're not talking about an ordinary baby here. We're talking about a very, very unique baby. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Who is this Jesus? Do you know who he is? Because many of you have ideas and you have a high opinion. But many in the church today have come to a conclusion that he was a very moral man, a very good man, maybe a prophet who had an insight into spiritual matters. He had a special favor from the Father, and he was unique, maybe in all of history unique. Maybe he's the only one that has ever been like him. But do we understand that his beginnings weren't in the womb of Mary? Do we understand that actually what scripture teaches is in the words of Jesus himself, he says, before Abraham was, I am. What does that mean? 
What he's declaring in saying that one statement is not just that he was before Abraham, and Abraham was like a long time in the past, but he's also making a declaration. In the Greek, we would understand it as ego I me, which is to the Jew the unspeakable words, the ineffable name of God, the one given to Moses at the burning bush, which is the I am that I am statement at the burning bush. Which means I was, I am, and I always will be. Uh, Did he just say that? Well, they picked up stones to stone him. They called it blasphemy, which is a misuse of that holy, ineffable name. However, is he misusing the name? What if he truly is the I am? So who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is from of old, from everlasting. The Bible actually goes even one step further and says he's the creator. Now, isn't that sort of almost mind-boggling where smoke starts coming out of your ears? Because I know many of you have a high vision of, and a high understanding of Jesus Christ. But to recognize that he is from of old, he is from everlasting, that he is actu- in actuality the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's like, whoa, whoa, Jesus? I mean, isn't Jesus the guy that died on the cross? Yes, but he's also the creator. John 1, 1 through 3, 10, and then verse 14. This is a compilation of the very beginning of John. In the beginning was the Word. Now, in this context, it's very, very clearly talking of one known as Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, And without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is an astounding statement. And I'm not sure if our brains can quite compute what was just said up on the screen there. But we're declaring that Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, was from the beginning. And that he wasn't just there in the beginning with God, but that all things that are made, all things that are created, were created and made by him. And this one who is the creator is going to take on flesh and dwell on this earth in our midst. Okay, I don't know if, I mean, we were just so used to it that it's like, yeah, 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 I know that, know that. That's astounding. Ephesians 3, 9 And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery from which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So Paul picks up the refrain and says the same thing. And he says, all things were created by Jesus Christ. Here Paul says it again in Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So I'm not just coming up with an opinion, like, oh, I want to make Jesus bigger than he's supposed to be. No, this is what the word of God declares Jesus to be. Our job is to elevate our understanding to what the word of God declares. Hebrews 1, 2, so the writer of Hebrews is going to pick up the same uh, refrain. God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So how did he make the worlds? Through his Son. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he was and is God. Now, there's a lot of ways that I could go through this. One of my favorite ways is to actually show how the name I am, which is God's uh, proper name is given at the burning bush, is going to be leveraged by Jesus. And John the Apostle in the Gospel of John is going to purposely go out of his way to showcase how Jesus is going to leverage that name for himself, which is going to make the Jews irate because they're going to basically saying he's making himself God. But what if he is God? Then it makes sense that he would declare himself to be God. 
However, most of us, when we read it, do not see it because the words I am don't necessarily trigger the same thought for us. Even the name Jesus itself, the name that is given to him, which is going to be declared the name above all names, is a mixture of the name I am, Jehovah, because that's how we translate it, Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Je uh, Yehovah, uh, Adonai in the Aramaic, all caps, Lord is another way that it's written in Scripture. That's the I am. But you take that, Jehovah, and mix it with a verb to save. And the name Jesus means the I am saves. That's pretty cool. But the Bible declares that he was and is God. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now, I've already established who built all things. He who built all things is God. Colossians 2.9, and then uh, going backwards to 119. For in him... Jesus dwell for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily for it pleased the father that in him speaking of Jesus should all fullness dwell Philippians 2 5 Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God now this is a unique translation of this but what it says is Jesus who is in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, it wasn't a criminal activity to be equal. Mark 2, 5 through 7. When Jesus saw their faith, this is the healing of the paralytic. Remember the guy that breaks through the, they break through the roof and drop him down at Jesus' feet? When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the one that is sick of the palsy, who's paralyzed, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So I really like that. It's a very unique thing because the whole situation seems so bizarre. Why is he forgiving the guy's sins? We all know what the guy is there for. He's there to be healed by the healer, Jesus. Instead, Jesus is going to throw a curveball and say, your sins are forgiven. And he knows he's doing this on purpose. He's even doing it for us. Because then you have the scribes, and he's going to read their mind, but what are they thinking? Only God can forgive sins. They're right. They're right. You see, only God can forgive sins. And that's precisely who is doing it. John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. John 5, 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. How dare he? Unless he is equal. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is canon tested and approved. So in the week-long training that a lot of you are here for, uh, we don't have the opportunity to go through one of my favorite messages, which is canon. And what we do is we measure Jesus against the Old Testament. Because one of the things that we oftentimes don't see when we read the New Testament is that it's actually the proving of the fact that he fulfills the Old Testament. That he is a fulfillment of all righteousness. That there's a righteousness, a righteous standard, a righteous requirement that is necessary for the Messiah to fulfill so that you could recognize any false messiah. How are you going to recognize the true messiah? Because this messiah has been forecasted and prophesied since the very beginning, right? In the Garden of Eden. This one that is the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. The very beginning, this test, or what we call the canon test here at Ellerslie, is going to be built. And it's the Old Testament, and there are many, 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 I'm going to go through 30 of them, but many prophecies that must be fulfilled for him to be proven to be the Messiah. So, what if he actually passes the test? Who is this Jesus then? Well, he is all that was declared in the Old Testament. 
He proved the son of God, number one. Number two, he proved the seed of the woman. And what you're going to see on the screen or in your notes is you're going to see an Old Testament prophecy and a New Testament fulfillment. He proved the seed of Abraham. Number four, he proved the seed of Isaac. These are all things that he must do. He proved the seed of David. Now, when I say that, that means he descended from Abraham. He descended from Isaac because Abraham had two sons, right? And he had to descend from Isaac. Not just, it couldn't be from Ishmael. And then when I say that he's, he's from the seed of David, well, Abraham had Isaac, but then Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, and one of those sons is Judah, and a descendant of Judah was David, and now, very specifically, he can't just be from Abraham and be from Isaac, he must be from David. And that is going to eliminate the pool of possibilities down to almost nil. He proved, number six, he proved to be born of a virgin, and he proved to be Emmanuel, God with us. Number seven, he proved to be born in Bethlehem, Judea. He had to be born in that exact location, otherwise he is not the Messiah. Number eight, he proved that kings fell down before him offering gifts. He proved to be called out of Egypt. What a strange thing. The guy had to be called out of Egypt, otherwise he's not the Messiah. He was. Number 10, he proved that Elijah came before him. Number 11, he proved anointed with the Spirit. Number 12, he proved that his ministry commenced in Galilee. Number 13, he proved to enter Jerusalem riding upon a colt. Number 14, he proved undesirable to many. Number 15, he proved meek. Number 16, he proved to be without guile. Number 17, he proved to be consumed with zeal for God's house. Number 18, he proved that he bore the reproach. Number 19, he proved betrayed by a friend. Number 20, he proved that his sheep were scattered. It, and it's not just that he needed to be betrayed by a friend. He needed to be betrayed for a very specific amount of money. And he proved to be sold for 30 pieces of silver in the potter's field purchased with the money. Even his enemies are going to prove him the Messiah. Number 22, he proved to be numbered with the criminals. Number 23, he proved to go silently as a lamb unto slaughter. Number 24, he proved to make intercession for his murderers. Number 25, he proved that lots were cast for his clothing. Number 26, he proved to die. In other words, he died, and he had to. Number 27, he proved that none of his bones were broken. He had to die in such a way where not one bone was broken. That's not an easy thing to manufacture when you're the one dying. And even when they came to him to break his legs, he's died. And even when they this Roman soldier who knows nothing about all this comes to break his legs, that's because that's what you do to hasten the death, they realize he's already dead. And instead, they fulfill Scripture by piercing his side. He proved to be pierced. Number 29, he proved risen from, again from the dead on the third day. Number 30, he proved to have ascended. Uh, yep, you test Jesus and you find out that he fulfills all of that Old Testament. That is remarkable. He was before the Old Testament, and then he comes after the Old Testament and fulfills every single thing that was declared about him in the Old Testament. And you could say, well, he cheated because he's the Word of God. That's right. You could call that cheating. You could call that just being really good at what you do. He started this whole thing, and then he fulfilled it all because he is God. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is overall, God forever, all-powerful, and holy sovereign. So here's a meditation of just a compilation of Scripture that I think you guys will enjoy. Very epic. My God has measured the waters of this earth in the hollow of his hand, meted out heaven with a span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. To him the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are as counted as a small dust of the balance. When he heads off to war, there are none that can stay his hand. He sits as king between the mighty cherubim, above all, over all, and in control of all, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God of all the kingdoms of this earth. He can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion. He can set the dominion of his ordinances in the earth, he can send forth lightning, number the clouds, and stay the bottles of heaven. He is the mighty God, the everlasting God, over all God blessed forever, the God of the whole earth, and his throne is forever and ever. 
He is the Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come, the creator of all things, the upholder of all things, the father of eternity, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He is the rock of ages, the head of every man, the head of all principality and power, Lord of lords, Lord both of the dead and living, Lord of all, Lord over all. He is the prince of princes, the prince of the kings of the earth, he that filleth all in all, the king of kings, the righteous judge, the king of saints, king of nations, king over all the earth, the king of glory, crowned with many crowns, and he sitteth king forever. And before him all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Before the mountains were brought forth or ever had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, he was God. When the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against him, he shall laugh and shall hold them in derision. He is bound by nothing but his own nature and his own law. He is not limited in power nor governed in action by the will or the pleasure of any angel, demon, or man, but rather he is limited and governed only by the dictums and restraints of his loving prerogative to gain for himself a peculiar people, to establish his kingdom in this earth, and to shed abroad his glory unto the heathen. And in the not so distant future, when he will return to bring terrible judgment to the nations, and his feet shall touch down on the Mount of Olives and see it divide asunder, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And all will behold the Ancient of Days, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, whose voice is as the sound of many waters, and whose countenance is the sun shining in all its strength. They will see the fiery stream issuing forth from before him, the thousand thousands ministering unto him, and the ten thousand times ten thousand that stand before him at the judgment. And all will behold the one at whose feet all crowns will be cast, for he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for he has created all things, and for his pleasure they are and were created. So in concert with the noble King David, I pronounce, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is salvation and that outside of him, no man can be saved. It's an incredible thing to attempt to fathom the grandeur of who our God is and therefore who Jesus is. But then to realize that this incredible, almighty, sovereign God is going to take interest in us, in our low estate, in our feeble condition, in our rebelliousness. I mean, why wouldn't he just dispose of us? Instead, he sees something in us that he loves and that he wants to redeem for his pleasure for his glory. And so he is going to personally become the way of salvation. He's king of all kings. He's lord of all lords. Why would he come here and become lowly and be born a baby and be treated with such scorn and such mockery? Why would he do that? To gain us? And yet that's the bewildering reality that we are all attempting to digest as believers. We believe it, but there's moments when we're startled by it afresh. You ever notice that it's very easy just to sort of nod along and go, yes, yes, that's true. As opposed to really see it. God Almighty has done this for us. If there was someone in this room that gave up their life for you, a bullet was flying at you, they shoved you out of the way and took it, you would be so stunned that someone would sacrifice their life for you. And yet Jesus did that not for someone that was in the best frame of mind towards him, but we were actually enemies. And many of us would have to acknowledge we were not that pleasant prior to Jesus Christ gaining us. Why would he see us 
and be willing to do what he has done. But that's part of the beauty and the power and the majesty of answering the question, who is this Jesus? Because he's not just grandeur. He's also mercy. He's love. He's kindness. He cares for us the way a shepherd cares for one lost sheep, the way a father cares for one lost child, the way a widow cares for one lost coin. He's humble, though he's almighty. And we are nothing, and yet we're proud. Something's twisted in us, but nothing is twisted in him. He's right. The way he is is perfect. But he desires to come in and invade our world and to rescue us and then to fill us with his very life so that he can make us like him. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is salvation and that outside of him no man can be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I like it better when way is capitalized, and I like it better when truth is capitalized, and I like it better when life is capitalized, because there is a way that is lowercase. It doesn't lead to life, but it's lowercase. It's the world's way. And there's a truth. There's truth in this world. Two plus two equals four, but that's not the truth we're talking about here. This is living. This will save you. And when you come to this truth, it alters your existence. And it needs to be capitalized. And life, this is not just, you know, you having breath in your lungs. This is breath in your spirit, man. This is capital L, life, and it's eternal. And Jesus said unto him, I am the capital W way. I am the capital T truth. And I am the capital L, life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That is either one very arrogant statement from one who is the most humble of all people that ever lived on earth, or it's truth. Uh, it's truth. I'm going with that. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to, unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Now, that's where your notes end, and I have a little bonus caveat here. I had a lot that I didn't put in this because, you know, to answer the question, who is Jesus? It's like, there is so much. I mean, it's like the entire Bible is going to answer that question. However, I wanted to at least get us a starter package for our soul to just refresh the awe, to refresh the understanding of his goodness, yet at the same time his grandeur. To get that, it's really hard for us to focus on multiple qualities of God simultaneously. It's like we start to burn out our little brains very quickly just seeing one thing. Like you start to study his mercy and you're like overwhelmed by it. And then I go over here and I talk about his, his, in, his infinite eternal nature. And you're like, oh, I can't handle that one right now, Eric. I'm still trying to digest his mercy. You see, we're very limited in our ability to, in our capacity to comprehend. Isn't it funny that God knows that? And so in a strange sense, we need each other to remind each other of the varying attributes constantly. Because it's like a diamond. You can't see the whole thing at once. You need to turn it. And it has different facets or faces to it. And that's the way God is. Every face, every facet is so glorious. But you can't see it all. You need to turn it. But as I hold it in the middle, all of us can see a different attribute. And as we, sometimes we become specialists in a different attribute because we spend so much time focused on it. But that can be a gift to the church. But it can also be a pain in the neck because everyone, this guy gets mad because no one else is talking about this one facet over here. Because this other guy keeps talking about his mercy over here. This guy's talking about his sovereignty over here. It's like, well, maybe we need to rotate this diamond a little and just take it in. Because it is true. He is all that. He is all that in one. Whoa! And we're so smallish. But he takes interest in us 
and he wants to live inside of us? That glory inside of this? Remarkable. So here's the meditation. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that is revealed in Scripture. And so you want to know the Father? You look at Jesus. And so that means all of who God is is revealed in and through this man. So it takes some of the names of God from the Old Testament. Jesus is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, or the All-Sufficient One. Jesus is El Elyon, the Most High God. Jesus is Adonai, Lord, Master. Jesus is Yahweh, Lord Jehovah, the I Am. Jesus is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, the Lord my miracle. Jesus is Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jesus is Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Jesus is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jesus is Jehovah Makashtikam, the Lord who sanctifies you, the Lord who makes holy. Jesus is El Olam, the everlasting God, the God of eternity, the God of the universe, the God of ancient days. Jesus is Elohim, God, judge, creator. Jesus is Kana, jealous. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jesus is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jesus is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of powers. So here's the question. It's Jesus asking you, not Eric. But I want you to allow this one who we know as creator, the almighty, the word of God made flesh, the bridegroom, the shepherd, the image of the father, this one to speak to you, the one who is your redeemer, your savior, your rescuer. But who do you say that I am? Because the answer to that question is what changes your life. If you reject who he is and who he's revealed to be in the word of God, it destroys you. When you agree in faith with what the word of God says, it rescues you, it redeems you, it regenerates you. You are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son. You are changed from being a first into a second. You are born again. You are grafted no longer into Adam's lineage and Adam's condemnation, but now you are grafted into Christ's lineage and Christ's triumph and inheritance. Not because of some work you did, because of, but because of the work that he did and does for us. Father, These are truths that most would call unfathomable. And yet you have given us the mind of Christ so that we, even if it be in a limited sense, can begin to fathom the unfathomable. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just fathom, but that we would respond, that we would give you what is due your name, that we would lay down our lives afresh to gain your capital L life. Lord, that we'd be willing to relinquish our hold on the steering wheel and let you have it. Lord, are you not worthy to receive all honor, all glory, all praise, all adoration, all worship? Lord, may we bend our knee to acknowledge that afresh today. Lord, we love you. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this.